right, what is up, guys? Welcome to episode nine of All Access, the photography podcast. Guys, I had to take a couple weeks off. Life got busy, had a couple of vacations planned, work got busy, some exploring trips, lots has been going on, but here we are, guys. We're back for the ninth episode of my podcast titled All Access. Today's guest is an OG. Very happy to have him on. His name is Sean Galbraith. He has been around since 2005, a real OG explorer. He's been all over the world exploring, all over Canada, United States, all through Europe. He's got some great stories to tell. He's a great guy. I've known him since I started this hobby in 2012. So let's get right to it, guys. Here we go. Episode number nine with Sean Galbraith. All right, guys, here we go. Episode number nine of All Access, the photography podcast. Today's guest is Sean Galbraith. He is uh, someone who I consider to be an OG in the hobby. And uh, Sean, your name is uh, someone who I've known since I started in 2012. Uh, You've traveled the world in search of abandoned places, capturing fantastic photos in large and medium format film. Uh, You've also seen great success in getting your work included in private and corporate collections. And um, having seen your work up close, that comes as no surprise to me. You literally wear many hats, <laughs> known for wearing a fedora and a bow tie on your explorers. You are a city planner, a passionate Torontonian, a skier, an axe thrower, bidet influencer, disc golfer. In addition to being a very talented photographer and urban explorer, Sean, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. That's the best intro I've ever had on a show. <laughs> good well thanks for joining us and uh i'm i'm glad to have some of these o- older or so not older but like I'm og older. explorers who've been around yeah. for a while and um i feel like a lot of people these days could use some some hints and some tips and some tricks from people like yourself who've been a while who've been around for a while um so why don't you tell us a little bit in your own words you know who is sean galbraith uh, well, I mean, beyond what you, what you included in the uh, in that intro, I'm not sure how much there is left to say. Um, I mean, I I started uh, I started exploring back in 2005. Um, I'm mostly out of the game now, I would say, um, but I was very active for probably 15 years or so maybe yeah. a little bit under that. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, uh, um, uh, I got to, I got to go to Europe. I've explored all over North America. Um, it's been, it was, it was a great time. I had really had a lot of fun doing it. Good. So, yeah, so you've, uh, I saw you joined UER in 2005. So that is when you started the hobby. Uh, so yeah. my podcast is a, is a tip of the hat to Jeff Chapman. Did you know him? No, I got into it shortly after he passed. Um, I was, um, uh, I, so prior to 2005, I was living in Florida, um, okay. to 2004. Uh, um, and when I was down there, I was, I was reading infiltration just online. Um, and I was aware of, of sort of UER, um, but for some reason, I don't, I, it never really occurred to me as this was something that I could do. So I never did any exploring when I lived in Florida. Um, uh, I'd only really got into it once I moved back home to Toronto. I, I lived in Toronto from 2001 to 2005, but I didn't pick up the hobby until, until 2012. And mm-hmm. I feel like I missed out on so many opportunities living downtown Toronto during that time. So, you, uh, you know, what was it like? You know, starting in 2005, before there were so many people and security was on to us. What was it like back then? Uh, it was, I would say it was sort of the, towards the end of the golden age of exploring. Mm-hmm. Um, it was, it was a lot, frankly, it was a lot easier, frankly. There in Toronto itself, there were a lot more sites. Um uh, before most of them got turned into condos or renovated or just demolished. Um, and then jumping across to, to, you know, to Buffalo and down to Detroit, it was just, it was just a playground. It was, it was awesome. 
Um, we, you, you never really had a shortage of sites that you could go to. And you had a, a, a number of, um, of sites that were like the beginner's guide to trespassing. So you could like, you could take, uh, take a newbie or a friend who was thinking, what the hell are you guys doing? And there were some easy sites and that were really interesting still, yeah. um, that you could take them to and introduce them to the hobby. Um, the, the most notable one in Toronto was the brickworks. Right. Uh, that was, that place was the best beginner's guide to trespassing uh, location that we had. I lived, I lived at Lakeshore and Carla for three oh. years and Hearn was literally in my backyard. Absolutely. And, you know, like I said, let's talk about missed opportunities. <laughs> I was right there. So you would have been into Hearn when it still had the turbines and when it still had yep. the everything, right? So much yep. easier to get into back then, I'm guessing. Yes. So <laughs> when we first started going into Hearn, um, uh, there wasn't the the big power, the new power station next door. And so you could just basically walk along the the shoreline on the the, the turning basin channel, and then just uh, hop a hop an easy fence and 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 run in. Um, right. There was always security, but it was they weren't really using it as much as a film studio location um, back then. It was it was it was easier, but still not risk free. And there, I mean at in 2008 a guy died in there yes uh, explorer so you know it was definitely never risk-free um yeah uh, but i i was exploring yeah like you said back when the turbines were still in and then you know gradually as as subsequent visits the turbines would were gone at some point uh Mm. and then the floor of the turbine hall was gone yeah um and at one point, uh, the Luminato Festival moved in, and that was kind of amazing to see the space reimagined and have yeah. a restaurant in the uh, in the uh, the control room. Control room. Yeah. <laughs> What's uh, so? What would you say back? You know, in, during your active time, what were some of your biggest and favorite? Let's start with Canada. Uh, sure. What were some of your favorite and uh, biggest explorers that you did during that time? It's funny. I, I didn't really explore a lot in Canada. Um, I was much more interested in jumping the border and going into the U S and doing road trips. Cause I liked, like, I don't, I don't particularly care for uh, some abandoned farmhouse somewhere. Um, yeah. I want, I want big sites, preferably right. industrial. Um, mm-hmm. And we didn't have a lot of those here in, in Canada. I mean, we had Hearn. Yeah. Um, uh, the Canada malting silos are, were pretty cool, but they're pretty limited. Um, yeah. uh, Consumers Glass in Hamilton, I think, what probably would have been my favorite industrial site to photograph um, in, uh, certainly in Ontario. Um, it, it was... I, it was really too bad when that one got knocked down. That was uh, yeah. that was a really good one. Though I wonder if the basement area is still accessible because oh, it, good, good it was on that big concrete. It had a concrete pad, and yeah. there's like a basement window looking thing that you can see from Gage Street. And oh, I wonder, I wonder if that's accessible because yeah. it had some interesting basement spaces in there. Um, but anyway, uh, the the. Um, uh, yeah, that was that was probably my favorite um, uh, favorite site in Ontario to photograph. Um, cool. Jumping jumping the border um, uh, in Buffalo, um, uh, Bethlehem Steel mm-hmm. was uh, that was that place was amazing. It was actually one of the first places I explored in in Buffalo uh, back in two thousand five. Um, uh, after the, after the train station, um, yeah. the Beth steel was, is vast. It's, it's mostly in use now. Yeah. Um, uh, and they tore down the amazing, um, administration building, which I think we were the first to get into and photograph. Um, that, that place was, was amazing. Um, of course, Detroit back then was um, was basically Disneyland yeah. of abandoned buildings um, yeah. from 
you know, Packard and Fisher Body 21 to the skyscrapers downtown to, you know, 25 schools and yeah. 30 churches. Like it was, it's not the same anymore by any stretch. Uh, right. It was so much, but it was so much fun. Um, hitting Philadelphia and the power stations there um, were amazing, uh, especially Richmond. That's probably the single best building that I've had an opportunity to get into um, oh, anywhere. Yeah. Place is incredible. Um, uh, I mean, we saw some amazing places in Europe as well. Like the, the list is, is pretty long. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, you talked about Detroit, and uh, I had to do my due diligence, and I reached out to Todd, Todd Sipes. Uh, I know you yeah. guys get together uh, every so often. Yep. He told a funny story about when you guys were at a church. Uh, he said your friend Brian was on a work call outside, <laughs> and he, you guys got an urgent text from him that two dudes are walking in with what yeah. looks like weapons or clubs. You were on the top floor. Uh, Todd was on the bottom floor in front of the pew- pews, and he whispers to you, what do I do? And you just kind of shrugged. He said, he <laughs> ducked down do? in the front row. You stayed up where you were while the guy slowly walked towards him down the aisles. And as they got closer, he just popped up and said, hey, and scared the shit out of these two guys who <laughs> just happened to grab some pipes just in case they needed them when they got inside. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was a fun day. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, so you did say you've um, – been out of the game mostly but you do get out still though right like maybe once a year or here and yeah here and there i do um uh it's just sort of changing life priorities and uh and different risk profiles you know when yeah. you're young and indestructible versus <laughs> now <laughs> yeah I'm very much i cannot run <laughs> anymore yeah, yeah. that is not gonna <laughs> happen and I leave it for I leave it for other people and in the game and um, it was it was it was an awesome time. I'm so happy that I did it. I got to see some amazing places and spaces that you just never would. You know all yeah. the reasons why we do this, right? But mm. um, you know it's, at some point the places that I wanted to check out were just getting farther and farther away. Yeah, because I've seen all the ones that were closer, and so it just become more of a more of an effort to actually do that and you know you can only take so many weeks off to to do like a an exploring road trip or whatever yeah for sure i mean i mean you know you're right about like the industrial spots they're so rare here like i i was lucky enough mm-hmm. to do nanocoke before they demolished it yep um i actually did nanocoke while it was still had power and you yeah know, you go in the control room and all the lights were going and the buttons were all Suck lit up all. and um i did uh lampton the other coal plant in near Sarnia. Nice. Um, yeah, there was. Did you some get into in Lakeview, or was that already gone? That was already gone. Oh yeah, yeah I didn't get Lakeview was pretty cool. Yeah, I've seen the pictures, but yeah, it's just, in terms of like you know, like all of the the mental hospitals are pretty much gone, with the exception of some. But yeah, yeah. you have to tra- you have to travel a lot farther to you know to see stuff. Like I went to Ohio uh, a few Lots weeks back in, back in March. Well, there was a huge steel mill that I could have Mm -hmm. done. But the problem with this is that you had to go in in the morning and stay all day and come out at night. So for me, it's like I could go and spend a whole day hitting a guy. I don't mind houses. So hitting houses and nursing homes, Mm -hmm. churches, you know, Mm -hmm. um, going to Cleveland, I could probably knock off eight spots in a day or I could spend all day at one. And I chose to do more with my trip than just the one. I totally, I totally get that. Um, there was a steel mill in I think it was West Virginia, the sort of the West Virginia, Ohio border that yeah. we did a, a full day inside. We had, we were, we had some cat and mouse with the security at one point. Um, mm-hmm. The, but yeah, there aren't, there, frankly, there aren't many sites around no. that are that interesting for that long. And yeah. you'd just be sitting there, you know, bored off your ass waiting for the sun to go down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. so what about, uh, let's talk about some war stories. Have you ever been badly hurt? I have thankfully never been badly hurt. No. Um, I fell most of the way through a floor once. <laughs> um, so I was, ex- uh, I was exploring this abandoned orphanage in Buffalo. I don't know if you got into that one or before it was sort of renovated. I don't think so. No, the German Roman Catholic orphanage in uh, in Buffalo. Um, 
And it was one of the early times that, that we had explored it. Um, this is probably 2006, okay, maybe seven, something like that. And I was there with, uh, with my group of guys and, um, uh, we're, you know, making our way through the building and I'm like, Oh, the kitchen's over here. I'm going to go check out the kitchen and sort of, and they just sort of kept going towards the chapel because the chapel was like one of the, you know, the marquee spots to shoot. Um, and so I'm just sort of walking through the, the kitchen and then I noticed that this floor is getting a little spongy, but then I start falling. Like, like shortly after, like, 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 oh, this floor feels bad. God, and then, why? Um, and uh, thankfully, I was able to. I, I had my arms out, and so I was able to sort of catch myself on the floor joists. Yeah. Um, and so I only fell most of the way through the floor, <laughs> which would have been hilarious, you know, if you're down below, just see these like. Feet <laughs> yeah. um, uh, but I was able to. I, I was like, you know, help, help. Um, yeah. But uh, they didn't come. Um, pick your exploring friends better. Um, uh, as I was able to extract myself, of course, get a picture of the hole that I made with my body, you know, still get the shot, but then, you know, make my way uh, back to my friends uh, yeah. relatively unscathed. <laughs> yeah. That was, that was, that was the thankfully the only uh, the only sort of safety scare that I've had like that. Um, I've, yeah. I've, got, I've got a friend who fell like three stories and broke like a shit ton of bones in his body, um, and uh, had to be like rescued by medical personnel. <laughs> like it's terrible. Wow. Yeah. What about uh, did you ever have you ever had any problems with uh, charges? So yeah, I couldn't go back to Pennsylvania for a little while. Okay. Um, uh, that was an expensive, uh, expensive day. Um, me and a buddy, um, we got, uh, we got caught sort of after the fact and, um, and there were, there were charges. We had to go to court and they, they've been dealt with now. They've been expunged and whatever, but yeah. Um, yeah, that was, that was, that was an expensive one. Um, but you know, at that point I'd been doing it for 18 years or whatever and gotten, gotten away with quite a lot. It was, it was time to, to pay the piper, I guess. Yeah. And, uh, basically your you know, price of admission for 18 years of, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'd, I'd made enough in, in, in photo sales that it did more than covered it, but yeah, yeah, it, yeah. it wasn't great. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not a never a good experience. <laughs> Wasn't I, there are better ways to spend there are. you know nine thousand dollars or whatever. <laughs> God. I had I had a charge about four years ago. Yeah. A stupid house. Of Only course. cost me two two grand um yeah. like, to get me out of it. But no no, you know, no criminal charges, everything was taken care of. But man, yeah. that's a lot of money. Yeah. Um so in 2009, you and your exploring partners of the what you called the DK Photo Group, yeah. you were a part of a six-episode TV series called Photo Explorers. So let me just read yeah. the little, a little bit of a description there. Photo Explorers follows an adventurous band of photographers and urban explorers as they slip behind the barricades to capture haunting images of abandoned buildings and structures from around the world. What was that experience like? It was amazing. Um, yeah. Photo Explorers was like getting paid to do this was, it was, it was amazing, frankly. Um, how it all came about was uh, a friend of mine sent me an ad from Craigslist of all things saying, Hey, you know, we're a local production company. We're doing a, a series on different types of photographers. Okay. And if any, if you're a different type of photographer, reach out to us and maybe we'll feature you. And so um, uh, I was like, oh, that sounds pretty cool. We're a different type of photographer. Yeah. Uh, this was 2007 or 2008. Okay. Um, and uh, and they, they, they responded back saying, yeah, that sounds, that sounds really cool. Um, let's do it. Let's arrange a time to meet up and explore something and shoot something. And I sent it over to the rest of my, my photography team. And, um, 
couple of the guys are like, that sounds, that sounds stupid. Uh, and one of the guys was like, yeah, that sounds fun. Let's totally do it. So he and I, we just went again to the, the easy spot in town, the Don Valley Brickworks. Yeah. And we shot an episode uh, of this show, which each episode like profiled three different types of photographers. Okay. Um, and, um, uh, and we were one of them. Uh, afterwards, my buddy and I were like, we just like pitched them. Like, why don't you just make a whole show about us? You see what we do. Um, uh, you know, it's cool yeah. and it's visually very interesting and we can clearly talk on camera. We're very comfortable mm-hmm. doing this thing. Right. Um, and he's like, yeah, yeah, I can totally do that. And so we, we, he developed a pitch and he went out and he sold, um, he sold a six episode series to Bravo Canada. Um, and at the time Bravo was still sort of the arts station. Um, very, very different from what it is now. Totally. Where it's like yeah. reruns of Desperate Housewives of Hoboken or whatever the hell it is. Yeah. Um, but back then it was like this is where you would part arts programming in Canada. And so they bought they bought a six episode series of us just sort of doing our thing. Um and uh with the the money from the you know from that from that sale, uh we were able to pay for a week's trip to Europe. Amazing. Um, he, yeah. the producer basically gave us almost like carte blanche to design the show in terms of where we would go, the types of buildings that we would get into. Um, like he trusted us that we knew what we were doing and, um, yeah, it was, it was amazing. We, so in, in six days in Europe, we went to um, we went to a coal mine in Belgium that looks like a castle, Hazard Chirot. Uh, then we went to from Belgium we went to France to uh, Chateau Besançon, which is an old tuberculosis sanatorium just north of Paris. Then we went to uh, Luxembourg and met up with um, a local guy there. We got into Centrale Thermique. Um, the big power station that's demolished now. Um, then we went to from there. We went to Chateau Noisy um, in Belgium, an old French castle chateau, which is now demolished. Uh, then we went to Germany. Uh, we got into the Kent School, which had a Nazi history, but turned out to basically just be a church. Okay. <laughs> um, which is kind of hard to film an entire episode around. Yeah. It was, yeah. there was, there was some filler in that one. Yeah. Um, uh, and then we went to Sintrenlaga in Germany, which was an old uh, metal sintering plant, which is also demolished. So I think one, I think half the locations that we went to are now demolished. Right. Um, yeah. and then we also got into some like other places just along the way. We got into an old military barracks in Liege and an old, um, uh this like old like manor south of paris we got into uh a uh, silo operation thing next to central thermique um it was amazing um chance of a lifetime eh yeah yeah and we did it we did it all like guerrilla style like we did it yeah. all no permission like exploring style mm-hmm. um uh run and gun and um yeah, get in, get out, get filming. Yeah, it was uh, it was super fun. Uh, so knowing the uh, community the way I know the community, and you probably do, having taken this hobby that at the time was very sort of underground and unknown, and putting it in the media, uh, did you pick? Did you get any slack from from the community for this? Less than I would have expected, frankly. <laughs> I think it is in part because nobody watched the show. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, I think that, that helped a lot. Um, when they sold the show, uh, Bravo again was sort of the arts and arts channel of Canada. And, um, uh, by the time we recorded the show and it was ready to, to, it was all edited and in the can, um, Bravo had been sold to bell media. 
Right. And Bell Media had no interest at all in an arts channel. Mm -hmm. And so the show was actually kind of homeless for a bit. Like it had, it didn't have anywhere to air. Okay. Um, Eventually it did run as part of the contact photography festival in May, 2009, I think it was. Um, And at that point, I think 12 people saw it. It was great. Um, (laughs) It was, we didn't, we didn't make, more episodes because too many people watched it. That's for sure. It right. Was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't too popular. Um, though, of course, you know, if it had become actually popular, that would have made it much harder to actually make the thing. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it's sort of when you're, when you're doing something you're not supposed to do, uh, popularity and eyes on the subject is, it can, can have an inverse relationship to to actually being able to do the thing right um uh, in the show when we were talking with the the producers we wanted to still sort of respect the ethics of the community at that time yeah um, of not naming this not naming the locations not giving where they are away just talking about the locations right and in a in as specifically vague as possible. Right. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> you know, um, I know that there is, th- and that was always a, um, a topic of much debate in the community. Mm-hmm. You know, should still you is. name locations? It still yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know it is less of a concern with certainly people who didn't explore during that era as right. much. Yeah. Um, you know, and certainly with the and sort of the YouTube era and the and now the TikTok era, like yeah. it, it, things have definitely changed from in my day before <laughs> I had all these these gray hairs. Um, yeah. uh, it was it, it definitely was a, a little bit different. Um, yeah, yeah, and that's what one of the again one of the reasons why I'm trying so hardly to, to, you know, promote the book and bring mm-hmm. in guys like you is to hopefully, you know, instill some of those older, those values and some of this older thinking to some of the newer, you know, like I'm still at it. I'm still very heavily involved in it. And I am using YouTube and Instagram and mm-hmm. TikTok and, mm-hmm. and you have to use your own sort of, uh, thinking of like, okay, so, you know, can I name this one? Should I name this one? Obviously you, you never should unless it's gone. But you've really got to be careful of what information you you put out there, especially now with so many eyes on the hobby, you know. And uh, it's a it's a slippery slope, it, and it's very difficult sometimes when you're trying to tell a story. To you know, I can imagine very, it would be. Yeah, it's a very important story to tell, but you can't tell the story and include this information without giving it away, you know. Anyways. That was something that we that was something that we wrestled with when we were doing photo explorers. It's something yeah. that um was you know it was again the, the topic of much debate you know you, you don't want to be the guy that blows up a location yeah <laughs> um but you want to you want to share your images you want to share your story yeah um and you know maybe you want to bring a couple friends yeah yeah but then they want to bring a couple friends and they want to and now it's an underground rave location (laughs) exactly (laughs) so it's yeah it was it's it's always been um uh it's always been a a a struggle and probably one of the most hotly debated topics in the community um around Mm. the you know the 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 topic of location sharing and and yeah totally I don't, I understand both sides of it for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I understand that, you know, I know about locations because people talk to me. Right. And other people know about locations because I talk to them and that's how, that's how the community sort of exists. (laughs) But it's, it's going outside that community. I think 
<laughs> anyway, when it's an under, when it's when it's an illegal activity, bringing more eyes to it is always a uh, is always a, a, a it's going to be a matter of great debate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, going back to my message with Todd, uh, mm-hmm. t- Todd says. Uh, I've always loved that Sean will dress in a nice suit and bow tie rather than elite tactical urbex clothes. He's just a <laughs> so the record. I've only actually, I think, done that once. <laughs> well, it I, wasn't a, I, I mean, it was in an Armani suit. It looked really good. <laughs> yeah, I had I had germ I had germ on two episodes ago, and he talked oh, about how germ. you you were like germs like Superman in the hobby, and he the first time he ever met you was at uh, Linseed. And he saw you up on the roof and he recognized you from your hat immediately oh, yeah. because of the, the yeah. fedora hat that you would wear when you're exploring. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I, I, I really enjoyed um, uh, uh, exploring with, with, with Germ at the old uh, uh, Peterborough prison. Yeah. Um, we actually yeah. got permission to go in there. And um, uh, that, was a, that was a really fun little explore. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I, I love Germ. He's, he's, he's awesome. Yeah, it's a great guy. Very good yeah, guy. Yeah, does great work. Yep. Um, so let's talk. I'm going to go back a little bit in my notes. As I mentioned in the intro that you, I'm, I'm pretty sure, exclusively shoot film and medium and large format. So does that mean you do not carry a digital camera around with you? Or are you only I evolved. shooting film? I evolved. Yeah. So um, when, I, when I first got into the game, it was definitely the, you know, into the digital era. Yeah. Um, I started with, um, with a point and shoot, Mm -hmm. uh, digital camera. I was still learning photography as well. Um, the, probably the first close to probably almost a year, maybe, maybe eight months of exploring was, was just with a point and shoot. Yeah. And then I upgraded to a digital, um, um, Nikon, I think it was a, what was it back then? D90, I think. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then I could really start to sort of see the possibilities of photography. Mm-hmm. When we went to Europe, um, uh, I had my my digital my digital camera as my main camera, but then yeah. I was also starting to sort of dabble in film a little bit, medium format, and um, I had with me a twenty dollar Russian Lubitel. Uh, meet twin lens medium format camera. Okay. Apps like plastic, like garbage camera. <laughs> totally crap. And yeah. during the, you know, during the week of, of filming the show, I think I took like, you know, like a thousand photographs as, <laughs> you know, you would normally do, do kind of yeah. spray and pray. Um, yeah. uh, and then I took one roll of film in that medium format camera. Okay. And of the thousand photos that I shot on the digital, um, I think I liked twenty, right? Twenty-five shots that were like, ah, I like this. Uh-huh. This is something that I want to show. Mm-hmm. And with the film camera, I liked ten of the twelve photos. On oh it. wow! And I really liked them. Yeah. Um, and I was like, I can't keep shooting digital. Mm-hmm. Cause it's not making me a better photographer. It's making me a volume photographer. And I didn't right. want to do that. I didn't want to take every photograph I wanted to take. Like if I'm pushing the shutter, I want this to be the shot or pretty close to it. Yeah. And I'm not there to document every fucking book in the library or whatever. Right. Like yeah. I want to, I want to make art, you know, I want to, mm-hmm. I want to make photographs and, and digital was, the was, indulging my sloppy side and then the photos right. weren't better. So I ended up selling all of my digital gear and I went film only, um, mm-hmm. started with medium format because it was big enough to, um, to get some resolution. I knew at this point I knew I wanted to do big prints. Right. And you know, I do like a, a standard print for me is 40 inches by 50 inches. Like it's right. really big. This one mm-hmm. behind me here is small. This is only like 36 by 36. Yeah. Um, and that was shot on film. Um, mm-hmm. but like I, but I didn't, I didn't want to go like, I wanted to like have a roll of film so I could still shoot some, but right. not shoot everything, have mm-hmm. that limitation 
but it wasn't so limiting that I could still take a bunch of stuff. Right. Sort of as a transition um, from digital to film. I didn't shoot everything. I shot enough. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, you know what? This is it's too generous still. I'm still taking too many photos. Yeah. And the resolution is good, but it's not mm, – it could be more. And then I started – um, I started experimenting with four by five. Um, okay. so, you know, four inch by five inch negatives, like really yeah. large, you know, under the Cape with the bellows focusing, yeah. um, you know, like from the 1920s style. Mm -hmm. And so I sold my medium format gear and I bought large format gear and absolutely loved it. And I shot large format for probably eight years right. like that. I was developing my own film in the kitchen. Um, and I would still scan the negatives, um, not do tradition, like not do wet prints from in a dark room. Yeah. Um, Cause I was shooting color and that's a giant pain in the ass. So I was still, yeah. still scanning the negs. So they were digital prints and I could touch them okay. up in Photoshop to remove dust and whatever. But generally speaking, I didn't do that much to them. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's, I, I loved shooting four by five. Um, at some point, mostly when I, largely stopped exploring um uh and i got a i got a contract to photograph um a big redevelopment project in toronto yeah um four by five was not going to cut it like there's, right there's no way i could photograph an eight-year project with a four by four by five camera is that um, the honest honest eds project yeah yeah the right. honest okay, eds yeah. project yeah and so um at that point i bought a digital medium format camera Okay. Um, and sold sold my four by five gear because it was just going to collect dust. I knew I wasn't really. Yeah. That era had been was sort of over, and now it's time for the something else era. Right. And right. Um, yeah. So now, now when I when I bust out the gear, it's digital medium format. But m frankly, most of the time, it's just iPhone. Right. Yeah. I remember like seeing a picture of you on a rooftop enough. once with your uh, with your big uh, medium or large format setup. Yeah. Yeah, I, <laughs> we. Uh, I think that was with Jono when we were on top of um, uh, one of the condo buildings, like three yeah. blocks from me. Yeah, um, yeah, I was on top of the roof, like rooftoping with four by five gear. <laughs> uh, <laughs> such a terrible idea. <laughs> yeah. So, so you've done some. Uh, you've done. You have definitely done some impressive stuff. I, I love the picture of you in the uh, ranking tunnels. In, in Niagara Falls with the with the umbrella with all the water oh dumping all God. over you. <laughs> that that was such a that was such a fun explore. Um, uh, a, a big shout out to Positive Pressure. You know, rest in peace, big guy. Uh, yeah, uh, one of the nicest people who has ever uh, gone behind a no trespassing sign. Mm -hmm. um, like a November weekend. At um, 11 o'clock at night, we meet this guy on the side of the road at Niagara Falls, and we start the excursion to get into the rank and tail race. Yeah. Which you've been in, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah you got I, came in from the, I came in from the top, though. <laughs> oh, you got in from the top. Oh, that's bold. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> well, I well there, was a, the um, there was a ladder when I went. There was a 30-foot ladder. ladder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we um we never got into the the wheel pit or the um the station above right um, right but yeah that that oh man that explorer was so much fun like four hours um getting in and out of that that tunnel overnight yeah. um i was woefully ill prepared um <laughs> for the darkness because again i was shooting film right and right like film and low light photography just really don't, don't go very well together. It's, it's a pain yeah. in the ass. Can't focus, can't see it's especially <laughs> four by five. So I ended up yeah. taking like one photograph. <laughs> that was, that was it. But the experience yeah. was, the experience was amazing. Totally. And, and yeah, uh, he, he, he brought in like wireless strobes and we're, we're setting them up in, in like Ziploc bags um and so he took that amazing photograph of me with an umbrella underneath the giant uh the giant wheel pit uh, uh -huh. tube 
pipe thing. And it's like backlit and front lit. Like it's, it's a perfectly exposed photo. He was yeah. a master of this stuff. It was awesome. That's excellent. And so, so you've, uh, like I said, you have remained heavily involved in, in the loop on things. So you've, um, yeah. so you're, you're still doing photography club talks. Yeah. Uh, I understand you're still putting your work out there. You're still mm-hmm. involved. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and yeah, you've been in lo- involved as long as I've known you. Um, mm-hmm. uh, we did touch on this. So I think I wanted to wrap this up with, um, seeing sure. as it's 2023 and mm-hmm. you started in 2005, oh what are God. some of the obvious <laughs> and maybe not so obvious differences from then to now? If, if, you know, again, we already sure. kind of did touch on that, but you know, what's, What's the same and, and what's different in your opinion from what you've seen? The, I mean, the main difference is, uh, is, is truly like the, the YouTube and TikTok um, uh, exposure. That was, there was nothing like that back in, you know, back in my day that was, you know, there wasn't the YouTubes and the ticks and the talks and the whatever. Like it wasn't that it was, it was definitely a little more underground thing. Um, it was a little closer to the infiltration zines than it is to just all video. Right. Um, uh, and, and the migration away from forums into, I don't know what people use discord, I guess. I don't know what the kids use these days. Yeah. There's Um, discord. Yep. Yep. Or uh, probably some Facebook groups for the olds still. Yeah. Um, uh and and sort of the i I don't even know if instagram is still the the place for this or not or if it's just moved mostly into video no Um, it's instagram is still pretty popular yeah yeah Yeah. Yeah. it's so the the transition of of away from private forums or largely away from private forums into much more public facing um uh I don't know, like farming, right, uh, right. like mm-hmm. that, that has been uh, a pretty significant change. Yeah. Um, and I am, I think it's a, a definitely a source of tension in the community, but I think the sort of the, 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 the spirit of it is still good. The spirit totally. of like the, the, the thrill of going in the, the fun of making either just like making media, like making these videos, exploring videos and making the photography, that part of it is, I, I think it's, I don't see any, it, it seems to be alive and well. Yeah, um, and I, I things, love that. Yeah. One of the things that I've found having me having come in when UER was still relatively active to where mm-hmm. we are now, what I think mm-hmm. has been lost is the art of storytelling. And I used to love reading germs write-ups, you know, or so these good. long write-ups about the whole experience or desync and his website and his story about mm. getting into conflict. He, is he still around? He is still around. I actually tried okay. to get him on the podcast. He said, see me next year. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't see but, you next um, Tuesday. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> but I think it, it's so much more now about the, the, the quick shot, and then it, you post it and then it's forgotten about. And that's why I, I keep my website going because I can tell the stories, you know, mm-hmm. and talk about the experience. And mm-hmm. it, it's funny going back to some of the things that you said, because you talk about, you know, you wanted to, you're more, much more quality shots than quantity. And I am trying so hard to change my mentality and my thinking mm-hmm. to that mm-hmm. because I take so many pictures. And I am, I'm, I'm documenting. And yeah. when I come out of a location and, and I go through my shots in Lightroom, I'll pick my top 10 or top 20. These are what I'm going to post first mm-hmm. about, you know, where, look at this, this is awesome. And then mm-hmm. the second, third and fourth posts are more of the story are more like the filler stuff. Yeah. And I, I try to get away from that because I want to more focus on, you know, here's a few really good pictures I took. But then when I'm in the location, I get so wrapped up and, oh, look at that. Look at that. Oh, neat. Look mm-hmm. at that. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know? But anyways, back to what I was saying is that I do, I think the, uh, I think I came in at a time where I can have a serious uh, respect for guys like you and where, where you guys came from and then transitioning to where we are now and that I can hopefully carry some of that over with the storytelling and, and, and all that kind of stuff. So 
That's why um, I love doing the the camera club presentations and presentations in general. Like, yeah, I I'm a talker. Like, I love telling the stories of the of the explorers and you know when the Department of Homeland Security almost got us and running from cops and when I got arrested and and falling through the floor. Like, I love. I love telling those stories um, and, and and with camera clubs, it's usually a lot of older people. I'm like, yeah, 70 year old, go, go trespass in that building. Like, I don't, I don't <laughs> fucking care. Like, yeah, go do yeah. it. Like it's super fun. Yeah. Trespassing is fun. Um, uh, I, I love, uh, you know, I love telling these stories uh, of, uh, of these little micro adventures. Um, yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think, I think, I think to the extent that things like YouTube and TikTok can be used to tell more stories mm -hmm. and not just, oh my God, we're going into this abandoned building. It's like super hype, man. And like, <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. Like yeah. that's to be, to be honest, our show was a little bit of like that because yeah. you know, it has to be interesting. <laughs> so yeah. This is a little hypocritical, but it's less so because I'm not doing it now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, like you, like it's such a great medium, video, to tell stories, um, and I think that's an that would be an awesome use of the medium. Totally. Um, not totally. just hey, it's another abandoned church or whatever. Yeah. Like I yeah. love your series of. Um, the same church, I think it was like over oh, yes. the years. Yeah. I yeah. love those, those time series because mm -hmm. that tells mm -hmm. a story. It's yeah. not just, yeah. Oh, we went to this place. It's kind of boring, whatever. There's a broken window and there's like a, yeah, a, I do both. I do there. both sides of that coin. <laughs> totally. totally. Yeah. Um, it's, there's, there definitely is, uh, an opportunity to use it as, as more storytelling. And that, that I think is, is, it has a lot of potential, um, to be great. And to some extent, carry on the traditions of the private forums from back yeah. in the day yeah. into a more public facing, uh, medium. Um, and, but then also just be able to do things that we weren't able to do back then. Right. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, I, I, uh, I absolutely love to see that stuff. And if you want to shoot less, get like a memory card from 2005 <laughs> and <laughs> one meg yeah. card or something. You yeah, get like yeah. half a photo, you get like the left half of a photo um, and your five, get a, get a splurge, get like a five yeah, twelve, yeah. Yeah, something yeah. <laughs> like that. And there you go. It's like shooting film. You get like six photos and that's, and it. that's it. You're, yeah. you're, you'll be, you'll be thinking like a film photographer as in you're editing the photo in your head before you take the camera out of the bag. Like, is this shot actually worth it? That's a really good idea. I would, have to idea. Think, I would yeah. think, is this shot worth $6? Because yeah. it's going to cost yeah. me the film. Like, I'm yeah. going out for a weekend with 10 shots of film. Yeah, yeah. That's it, 10 sheets. Mm -hmm. Is this the one? It's cool, but it's not yeah. good enough for me to spend six yeah. bucks on the film and the processing and whatever. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I think I'm going to take that advice on a, on an outing. I'm going to mm -hmm. bring my smaller memory cards and mm -hmm. I'm going to force myself to work with less. And, that, and that's a great bit of advice. Is this <laughs> shutter that I'm about to push? Is this, yeah. is this the shot? Yeah. Yeah. That I can't get back. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up there. That's a great way to end things. Take from the old school, bring it to the new <laughs> school, try and <laughs> try and uh, learn a little bit. Um, so what I will say to the listeners and the viewers, you can see Sean, Sean Galbraith on Instagram. He's also got a lot of his work on his website, seangalbraith.com. You can also see his work on 500px and on Flickr. Go back and uh, there's so much great gold going. Oh my through god, I haven't Flickr. heard those in a long time. Right, but you've got some great work there. So, uh, talking about now. urban exploring, that's where you can see Sean's work. Uh, Sean, thanks a lot for being here on the podcast. It's been great having you. And don't forget, Photo Explorers, you can watch it on YouTube. 
Oh, you can. You can. Yeah, the all the episodes okay. are up on YouTube. If you wanted to be the the fifteenth person to watch the show, <laughs> I'm going to link it so that everybody can watch that down Sweet. below. All right. Thanks for having thanks me. All right. Thanks, Sean. Okay, guys, Urbex Book Club time. Once again, as we do at the end of every episode, we're going to pull a paragraph or two out of Access All Areas, the book that inspired the name of my podcast, uh, released in 2005 by Jeff Chapman, also known as Ninja Licious. Before we get reading, guys, I highly recommend this book to anybody who's in this hobby. Hit the link in the description on the podcast to go to Amazon and pick yourself up a copy of Access All Areas. Highly recommend you read it. I'm on my fourth time reading it today. So Sean and I talked about sharing and who you should be sharing information with, who you should bring with you. You know, you find a place, you bring a friend, that person then goes back and brings another friend, that person brings two friends. Next thing you know, you've really blown up a spot and you didn't even mean to. So I also talked about storytelling and how much information you should give away in your storytelling when talking about an explorer. So I'm going to go to page number 213 under a chapter conveniently called sharing. While it is very kind to give your fellow explorers tips about particular spots they might want to examine and perhaps even a hint or two about approaches they might try, it's easy to give away too much information and thereby diminish the other person's experience or cause other larger problems. Sharing a hint or two or even better, a warning or two about a particular area or a building with other explorers, either online or in print, is great. But please don't give away specific entrances or access points, Perhaps except, except perhaps to illustrate a general principle. I'll have more on that point and a personal experience in a minute. But moving along. Giving the general public too much of the wrong sort of information can make a site more attractive and vulnerable to people who aren't primarily motivated by the urge to explore, such as vandals looking for tunnels to tag, partiers looking for an abandoned building where they can hold a rave, thieves looking for a building to plunder, idiots looking for a place to burn down, or other bad people of all stripes looking to make the world a worse place. If you perceive that a place is vulnerable to such threats, Save your inside information about vulnerabilities for venues where you're fairly sure that your audience is on the same wavelength as you and will treat exploration sites with the reverence they deserve. So that touches on two different points. The first point he talked about, about not giving your friends everything that they need to know. When I did the Niagara Falls power plants quite a few years back, my friend Urban Downfall basically he had just posted some pictures and I was like, I've got to get in there. I've known this location my whole life. I really want to get in. All I needed to know was that I can get in. I didn't want to know how to get into the tunnels. I didn't want to know how to even get in. All I needed to know is that I could get in. And that made that experience way better for me because I got there. I figured everything else out on my own. I found how to get in. I figured out the security details. I found my way down through the tunnels everything on my own. Much, much better experience for me and probably for you to figure things out on your own rather than just be spoon fed all the information by the person who was already there. Put in the work. Now, I'm not going to lie. I have been spoon fed in the past and it made it for a much easier experience, but not as satisfying. The other thing that Jeff is talking about is the sensitivity of information that you provide when you're storytelling, when you're posting. And I've been guilty of both sides of this. I've put too much information out there and I've blown up a spot. It, it is what it is. I can't take it back. But now I can be much more careful with what information I put out by not posting exteriors, not tagging the city, um, watching what's outside of a window. Sometimes people will post a photo not realizing that the name of the street is visible in a window in their picture. Watch what information you provide in your storytelling, in your tagging, in your captions, even in your pictures to try and help keep these locations from getting into the hands of the wrong people. So with that, guys, that wraps up episode nine of All Access, the photography podcast. Thank you so much to Sean Galbraith, our guest on this episode. 
great original OG type explorer. Like I said, follow him, go check out his Instagram, check out his 500px, his Flickr, or his website, seangalbraith.com. Um, I am still working on the interview with the lawyer. Obviously, lawyers are very busy, so she and I have had to reschedule this one until the end of July. So hopefully that one will be coming soon. And uh, I'm going to see who I can talk to next week. Got lots more episodes in the future to come. So thanks a lot, guys. Make sure you guys hit the uh, subscribe button to subscribe to the podcast. And if you're watching this on Apple Podcasts, please give a review. Help get this podcast seen by more people. And that's about it, guys. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. See you guys next time. Peace.